Welcome in, everyone, to another edition of Odds on Insights with Bully the Board. As always, it's Kevin, Seth, and Steve with you, and we are joined by our special guest this time, Ed Miller, author of numerous books, Sports Gambling and Poker Legend. It's a very fun and exciting episode. We're excited, so let's get right into it. Give a damn about a hater when I feel like it. Not today, not today, not today, not tomorrow. Get out my way, please, I'm trying to get paid. Not today, not today. All right, Ed, thank you very much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Looking forward, looking forward to the conversation. Um, I want to start, or we would like, we'd like to start basically, we'll call it your villain or, origin story. All right, so we, how, how did you kind of come up in this space? Because you, 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 made your, you made your bucks or your name, so to speak, you know, you're in, the, in the poker space for, for many years, and then kind of at some point along the lines, Met up with Matt David Dow and, and got into yep. the sports gambling things. Tell us a little bit about about that background, and then basically, what was the impetus or what was the factors that went into ultimately deciding to to write your guys' first book, Logic of Sports Betting? Because to our knowledge, and maybe to yours as well, nothing like that had existed prior to your guys' publication of that. Yeah. So, uh, well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Uh, it's always fun. Um, and uh yeah i got into gambling 20 years ago now um actually longer than that and uh <laughs> i got in it just as a hobby like playing poker um as something to do you know as a hobby i was out of college and had a job and stuff and then the job kind of didn't go well and i got a little better at poker i was reading the like you know david sklansky books and stuff at the time and uh, i got to a point where i was pretty sure i was good enough to play to replace my salary and so i ended up quitting my job and yeah. playing poker i moved to vegas uh, i did that for a few years um and then i got burnt out on the playing full time you know it's just kind of like you know after you do it for two or three years it's like okay but now what <laughs> um so and that's but that's right when poker was exploding in popularity so that's that's why i decided to write a book because i'd always my mom was an english professor and i've always liked words and writing and everything so i said hey you know instead of playing why don't i write a strategy book and kind of teach all the new people a little something about how to get started so that's how i started writing um and i was kind of doing that for a while up until 2015 and uh you know i'm in the gambling space do little gambling things here and there um and then uh 2015 I decided to dive headfirst into the daily fantasy stuff. That's how I got into sports. Because mm. I, I was aware of daily fantasy. Daily fantasy started as a result of the UIEGA, which is a federal law they passed. If, I, if you're old, you might remember this. It's like 2007. This is the first federal law. They, this was like before Black Friday. This was like four years, um, years before. But to say it's the same idea, right? Um, they, they said, you know, it, it was illegal to make bank transactions for online poker is what the uh, law was, right? But they had a special carve out for fantasy sports. So it says that like, it was like illegal to make bank, bank transactions for online gambling. And then it says, except fantasy sports. And so immediately someone was like, well, let's see what we could do with this. So uh, that's how Daily Fantasy, I don't know if you all knew, but that's how the, the game started. Daily Fantasy sports was like, basically a direct rip from poker it was like everything was poker tournaments everything the way the poker the lobby was set up was like a poker so everything was poker except there wasn't poker it was fantasy sports uh and i i thought i was abused by that just from a like a chutzpah perspective right. <laughs> uh right. so i checked it out and uh you know i was like i was like this is cute but this is a, not a good game like this is it's too like the casual sports fan will just get slaughtered by someone who actually wants to take this seriously and win, right? That was my take. And that was my take for basically six years until, you know, and then six years and half a billion dollars of venture capital investment later, and we've got fan one DraftKings. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm an idiot if I don't like, you know, if my thesis was it's too easy for the gamblers to get the money, well, why don't I just go get the money? So, so that was, that happened in 2015. So that was, I had a kid in there, you know, I was raising my kids. So that's kind of why I didn't do it up until, but my kid was five at that point. And, you know, he was, he, he could wipe his own ass. And I was like, well, maybe I'm trying to make some money again. Right. Um, so, 
Yeah, so uh, that's how I got into sports, was I, I decided to start doing that. And then just my meeting with M Matt Davidow, who's been my partner for the last eight years, um, was just kind of a chance in relationship. We got both got called in to consult on the same kind of fantasy sports startup project. And, uh, you know, I kind of showed him my nerdy DFS stuff I'd built. And then turned out we kind of had the same strategy you know, lineup building strategy that we'd come to independently, but I built some software and he was like, Hey, you want to build some other software? And, and that's kind of how we got started. So that's yeah, awesome. Very cool. and, and then I'm glad, I mean, glad the meeting happened and glad you guys linked up because that again, ultimately led to your guys's publication of logic of sports betting, which um, again, for us, and I'm sure for many others you've interviewed or you've heard anecdotally from really served as I'll call it a paradigm shift in the way you thought about how markets worked and you know, how they actually worked. Frankly, you know, you, people have a huge misconception of that, even, even now to this day. So what was, yeah, what was your motivation for that? Did you realize that there was just like this huge information gap? In, in yeah, that's exactly why we wrote it. Yeah. So, so by that point, so we published that book in 2019, by that point we'd already started. So we started, what I did when I linked up with him is 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 we started writing in play models for the U.S. sports. So basically, I built statistical models for uh, for NFL first, and then we did college football, MLB, NBA, and college basketball. And then at the end, we kind of did NHL too. So I built six of them. Um, but the main focus was on kind of the biggest American sports. And yeah, we wanted to nail making in play lines for those sports. That was the goal. We wanted to have the best in play lines making in the whole world for those sports. Um, and uh, yeah, we did it. The, the, the original objective was to point it at the betting side. Um, and then when the PASPA thing happened in, in the Supreme Court, we kind of had a powwow. We said, hey, we've got these models. We think they're the best in the world at making in play lines. We think we see what else is out there. We think what we have is a lot better. Um, can we make more of this by starting a company and basically selling it, the lines? That's what we decided to do for better or worse. <laughs> uh, so we started a company in two, in 2018. Um, and yeah, that was the premise. The premise was, you know, this is, these are the best, you know, lines on these sports that all of a sudden matter a lot and you should buy them sports. Books. <laughs> uh, so that was the company. Uh, the company's still going. It's called Huddle. Um, we make, lines for sports books and we now have products like single game parlay and some some all the you know the new hot stuff um but in 2019 yeah exactly like i perceived that there was just a massive information gap like there was just the 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 discourse i saw about sports betting like people just didn't know what the hell they were talking about for lack of a better term and yeah. and and our perception was my percent you know people are like oh well why do you want to educate my my perception is you know our what we bring to the table is more valuable if everybody kind of ups their game right if everybody understands a little more about what they're looking at, how to navigate the system, you know, how do lines get made, who's involved with this, how do markets work, like that kind of baseline knowledge. I was like, this is good for us if the entire world kind of starts from here. Um, and it, it, you know, if I'm to be completely candid, I mean, when we started the business in 2018, we heard a lot of people saying like, you know, First of all, they were like, nothing's wrong with our lives. And I'm like, yes, there is. <laughs> and, then, and then the other stuff we heard was like, was like, well, it doesn't matter. Everyone's an idiot. <laughs> I mean, I'm paraphrasing. I'm being, a, I'm yeah, being yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. But, but, but yeah, the, there was a little bit of that on, from the industry side. And I'm like, well, <laughs> let me write a book and, <laughs> and invalidate that particular nonsense. So, yeah, that was, that was, I would say, the number one motivation for writing that book was, um, and, and honestly, the new book, the, the, the new book is, is very much the same motivation as I, I, yeah. I we want to kind of close some knowledge gaps. Yeah. Can I can I uh, expand on that real quick? So yeah. in Interception, which, by the way, absolutely love it. Love Logic of Sports Betting. Love Interception. Both great reads. Um, you <laughs> shout out. Seth, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so so uh, what, first and foremost, you know, I hear, you know, Ed Miller. It's going up. His lines are better than what's in the market. And I get immediately discouraged because it's hard to beat the sports book as it is. How are we going to beat you now? But with that being said, you mentioned that there, you had a line in this, in this book and you said 
you want to fix the fragility of the system um, that savvy betters can take advantage of. And I was kind of curious if you can kind of expand on, in your mind, like what's this new vision of this industry after you fix it, and how does that affect casual and sharp betters? Right. So, so what we mean by the fragility, what I mean by the fragility in the system is so. I have to kind of explain this a little bit, I think. So, so I'll try to do it quickly. So, there's there's sports betting markets, and the markets I would call robust, like the opposite of fragile. And you know, it's somewhere in between. Some of these markets are less and more liquid, whatever. There's nuance to it. But the idea is like, if you take your basic NFL point spread, right? You know, whatever, Green Bay minus seven and a half, whatever, right? So that point spread is determined by a market is determined by people bidding on that price one side or the other on a sports book now the people bidding we call them in the book at our politics it's not the general public it's not it's really a very small subset of the betting public who takes right. this stuff way too seriously and <laughs> bets a fair bit of money and they kind of play in their own little playhouse against each other um and that's how those lines are determined so those lines are basically hashed out by nerds playing this game hard uh off in a corner and then they come up with their answer and then that answer basically gets copied everywhere else so that answer then gets copied into your biggest sports books you know today but the thing is that answer is a pretty good answer i mean the, the, those nerds are good at what they do once they come up with roughly a consensus answer to what the line should be that line's pretty good you know and it's, it's hard if you want to bet into that line you're basically saying i know better than that entire collection of people who take this too seriously you're not you're not saying i know better than that one person you're saying you know better than the wisdom of the crowd which is really a strong statement it's not impossible um and there are things that kind of slip through the cracks but it's you have to i think really understand what you're doing to to be able to make say that you can uh beat those uh the the market making process but that's just for the main lines. If you go to a mo we call it modern sports books in the in the book. It's my term for, you know, you go to the website, there's a thousand bets, right? So on the Green Bay game, there's not going to be, you know, point spread, money line, total, first half bets, one or two player props, you know, 12 bets total you can make. There's 300 bets, right? You open the menu, there's, you know, over 47 and a half, over 48 and a half, over 49 and a half, over whatever. There's single game parlays. There's all the stuff that you could bet in game. All that stuff, none of that is a market. There's no wisdom of the crowd in that. That stuff all gets made by companies like ours. And it comes out of a model like what I wrote. So I basically wrote a math problem <laughs> that takes, I mean, I'm, oversimplifying what it does but it basically takes that market information you give it as inputs that market okay the game is minus seven and a half 43 and a half and here's some other information about it that we know right you tell the the, the model that and then it, the model's job is to spit out prices on 300 other things right but that's only those prices are only as good as ed's math is Right. That that's the bottom line. And that's what we talk about is the fragility in the system, because because. The more markets you add, right, think about what you're, you're you, that, that that foundation isn't getting any stronger. Right. The foundation that all of that math is built on top of is still just the nerds in the corner <laughs> and they're not that's not getting any more robust. There's no nobody's building out deeper, heavier concrete foundations. What they're doing is they're building on top more and more and more and more on top of that same little foundation. They're doing ever more math. They're doing single game parlays now. They're doing, you know, micro market stuff where it's like, is this going to be a run or a pass? Is this going to be, you know, and it's like every time you want to, and all these, it, it's just, you're doing more math at the top of more math. And there's no way to do it all right. It's just, that's a point we make in the book. It's like, at some point, once you make all these markets, you can't get it all right. It's literally impossible. And uh, that's the fragility. So as long as the 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 business and 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 the business incentive a hundred percent right now is more 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 markets. Mm -hmm. They want more bets. You know yeah. what we have our three hundred bets are not enough. We want five hundred. That's literally the that is the. I mean, as someone who has worked on the company that feels that request, you know, when customer we're selling our products to a sports book, 
and they say, do you have this? Do you have that? Can we have more? We, we noticed this sports book has this bet. Can you give us that? Right. They want more. They want they want everything their competitor has and more is what they want. Right. And that's true for every one of these sports books. So they're all looking at their competitors, seeing what they have and asking for that and more. Right. So it's just so the the problem is, is the more you ask for the it all gets spread out thinner and it's just yeah. you can't get all, any of it right. And what that does is that creates there's only one way to deal with that if you're a sports book is you have to basically kick out anyone who dares to try to beat it. I mean, that's literally the only answer. I mean, if you insist on having all this product like this, and I understand why they want it, it's fun. Some of it's, a lot of it's fun, a lot of the new stuff. i definitely not poo-pooing it in any way, but but that's the only answer. I mean, they, you know, otherwise, I mean, if someone let me bet, if, if, if someone gave me one of these modern sportsbooks menus and gave me $10 in the account and said, go ahead, go, no restrictions on what you could do i mean it would be a million dollars in a couple months because it's just i mean the power of compounding interest i mean there's just enough winning bets on the menu i just have to make them and wait for them to win and then roll it over and roll it over and roll it over and bam you know and so if they can't allow that obviously they can't allow that because if they allowed that they'd be broke so yeah so that's that's what i mean by the fragility in the system and my answer to that is is well, let's meet this in the middle. Let's do a better job on more of the markets as far as trying to get the pricing good. And maybe let's not offer 3 million markets. Let's <laughs> maybe curate that list a little bit, you know, figure out what's actually fun, what people actually want to play, only list those bets and then do a good job on the pricing. So what does that look look like for casual betters? For casual betters, it's just a better experience all the way around. It means you never get sent an email saying, Oh, by the way, the the line you bet was minus two hundred, but it was supposed to be minus six hundred. So instead of paying you your fifty dollars, we're paying you your fifteen dollars. Thank you and goodbye. I mean, sportsbooks yeah. send those. I don't know if you all have gotten those emails, but they send them. And I mean, that's a terrible customer, absolutely terrible customer experience yeah. to be sent an email saying, "Oh, that money you won." Just kidding. You know, our our bad, but just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but give our money back, please. Right? Yeah, but we're not not give us our money back. We're taking our money back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You They're will not you will see less money in your account, and here's why. Uh, yeah. So less of that. I mean, not none of that. Ideally, almost none of that. I mean, it's impossible to be completely without mistake. Believe me, I know <laughs> we've made our share of mistakes. I understand what it's like to be on the other side of that sometimes, but um. But yeah, I, you know, the fewer mistakes, that's a better experience. It means your bets go through all this stuff where you click the bet and it goes dick, 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 dick. Oh, sorry, that line isn't available anymore. Maybe you want this mm-hmm. other, you know, all that stuff sucks. You know, let's get rid yeah. of that. You know, I mean, all the stuff with the limits, they play with people's limits. Oh, you could bet $37.22 on the, all that stuff. I mean, it's just bad customer experience. It's all because the 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 market making is. I mean, the the lines making is spread too thin, and they have too many. Lines. So you know, that's what it that's what it looks like to me when you when you clean up the fragility is you is that is that casual customer experience or even the serious betting customer experience is is all that stuff is cleaned up. What does it mean if you're trying to win? Well, it means you got to be smarter <laughs> if you want to win. You know. That's that's the bottom line. It means you got to be smarter than the than it, it's not impossible. It's never going to be impossible to sure. win because this is not this is not roulette. This is not guided by the laws of physics. This is <laughs> this is Ed Miller and his you know math problem math. and whatever nerd math and yeah, and yeah. you know and I mean doing his best job. That's I mean that's who you're up against. It's not you know the laws of <laughs> it's not the right. laws of the universe. Believe me, you know. So yeah. Yeah, so I, I was going to ask a quick question. You you had done a, a really great job there of kind of describing, you know, how markets actually work, right? In in your words, these these nerds are getting together. They're they're making a robust number. You know, one thing I wanted to kind of ask you is your thoughts on, you know, sports betters, especially people that are getting introduced, you know, now they go online and they see a million different, you know, touts or or, or opinions, what what have you, and that you know they're all talking about, okay, you know, it's Sunday morning today. This is what I'm betting and. 
you know, one thing that we always you know try to educate our audience on is like, you know, if you're betting on Sunday, you're going to have a tough time. But can you talk a little bit about your opinion on that? And, you know, and we're talking about uh, NFL in this case, but like, you know, how robust those markets can be and by the, you know, when maybe the optimal time is someone should be betting those main markets? I mean, if you're, if it's a main market, like a point spread or a money line or a total, I mean, Sunday morning, you're not, anyone listening to this is not beating that. I mean, just full stop. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's just, it, that's the hardest thing in sports betting to beat. And again, it's nothing against you. It's just the, those numbers have been hammered into place by everybody who takes this stuff seriously by that point. So you're basically saying, you know, better than literally. I mean, it's like if I walked into a chess tournament and the world champion is there and there's 10 other guys and I'm like, I'm going to beat y'all. Yeah. I mean, I'm just not <laughs> like, even if I'm good at chess, like it's just, yeah. it's just, that's, that's just delusional, right? So when, when can you beat those lines? I mean, you know, the, the sooner the better. There's there's no time that's too early if you yeah, want yeah. to try to win. The better, um, really bad often. Yeah, because because the way it works is the, 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 the limits start low. But the way it works is someone goes, takes a guess, right? Someone takes a guess. So if you get that first bet in, you're betting against one person's opinion, period. Like, easily beatable, right? And then, so those early bets are, but they're all low limits. All the early bets are low limits. So the people who are really good at this don't bet that because, you know, why would you, why would, why would I, if I'm good at this, genuinely good at this, why am I going to make a $300 bet with my information, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not good. I'm not going to sell my information for that. Whatever the EV is on a $300 bet, you know, maybe I got 3% EV. Okay. I made $9 on my $300 bet. With my information, and my information's worth more than that. So I'm not, I, I'm not going to do that. So the people who bet early are the people who are on the way up, let's say, you know. Sure. And so, can you, can you beat the, the col small collection of people who bet early? Entirely possible, right? And then, and then it just, as time goes on, and then the limits go up at the market makers. It's just that the line just gets sharper, basically, as time goes on. Right. Yeah. And then by the time. But again, I want to be clear that I'm only talking about the market made lines. I'm talking about NFL point spread, full game point spread, first half point spread, money line. I'm not talking about alternate total 72 and a half or or basically any player prop. Any player prop is not this is not applied to or any in play line. This logic really doesn't quite apply to the earth. The very first, like, we make a distinction in the book between the in-play lines that happen earliest in the game and the ones that happen later in the game. That first line, like, you know, let's say, let's say you got, you know, whatever, Packers minus seven and a half, the game starts, they, they go down the field, they kick a field goal, and now it's, you know, whatever, nine and a half, or whatever it is, right? Whatever the new line is. Well, that line's also probably pretty good. Why? Because seven and a half was good, and yeah. then it ain't that hard to figure out what the, the, the new field goal does. Because it's only one thing has happened, really. So that math is easy. So that answer is pretty good. But by the time you get into the second quarter, the third quarter, I mean, those lines are the the more game that's happened. The, there's no strength to those lines necessarily anymore. Yeah, so, and I think inter yeah. interception does a really good job. I think of delineating those two things and seeing, yeah. yeah, where where should you be attacking if you don't, you know, if you. It's much easier to have an edge in those non. Uh, like market made numbers, right? And I yeah, think I mean, why, why, really why would problem. you want to bet against all the all the stars people in the world when you could bet against? Yeah, some, just some one math computer problem. program yeah. somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Kevin, I think you're. Yeah, yeah, I had a question. Um, so I mean, you, in the book, you go, you guys talk about a lot of different angles that betters could take. In, with respect to how to, you know, find the holes or, you know, the Swiss cheese model, you know, how to attack the sports books um, yep. and find good bets. One of the things that we've seen or, you know, just anecdotally floating around on social media is, is everyone's kind of getting up in arms to an extent about the information arbitrage angle that you talk about. So specifically like the breaking news business, right? right. You have these insiders, the Woges, the Adam Schefters of mm -hmm. the world who, break news and then markets not always but sometimes shift you know on the major market lines right right ever so slightly depending on the news so what's your opinion if on how that 
information arbitrage angle shifts over the coming years, considering that a lot of these insider guys are now employed by parents of sports books. Right. I mean, it, it, so it, it's kind of an open-ended question, I would say. I, I, I would say the whole topic's tricky, right? Uh, the information 100% matters. I mean, full stop, you know? I mean, it matters who's playing, how much playing time they're getting, you know, whether they're going to be – I mean, all that stuff matters. And somebody's going to know about it before somebody else knows about it. Yeah. I mean, and it's just – it's there's – there's there's it, it, obviously, I think uh, – maybe it's not obvious, but I, I do think that the, the most – transparency the, the more transparency the better i do think sometimes people over over the, the one thing i'll say on that is so i think it'd be great if they were transparent if they had sort of a rule set for how they i mean they already do but you know maybe a little more codified when when do these things need to be announced by when do these things need to be announced by what you have to put percentages you have to you know they have to be realistic they i don't know you know maybe some more external rules and transparency surrounding you're never going to stop the insider there's always going to be somebody who knows before the things announced right so i mean you just try to do your best with that so the thing you mentioned about and i've seen this too on social media where people are upset oh so and so works for FanDuel, and he also has access to the team i in general i don't take that stuff as seriously because the, these are these are huge institutions and often the lines are made by people who aren't at the sports book like for instance we're making in play lines like let's say let's say we had a customer we have our our the operators in the book are beaver bet and bet beaver right yeah, so let's yeah. say let's say i'm i'm running a company that does not my company just for the same reason but some other company you know we make lines dot ink and i have a, a relationship with bet beaver that i'm gonna transmit nba lines to them right i'm gonna make i'm gonna make nba props i'm gonna make nba lines i'm gonna make in play lines i'm gonna do all the nba stuff for this for this sports book. and then also bet beaver employs a guy who is a reporter for the nba and reports on the nba and and he gets some scoops, right? He gets, he's got sources, people talk to him. Well, there's sort of the implication that that, that guy is like, information is fed into the line, when in fact, no, I mean, I have no conduit to that person at all in any way, working at my company and my, now could I, could, could Bet Beaver say, hey, you know, we'll have the back channel where such and such, I mean, theoretically that's possible, Obviously, yeah. that's possible. I could tell you in practice, like, you know, there are, first of all, it's potentially illegal. No, absolutely nobody on the industry side wants to do illegal stuff. That I could tell you for sure. There's one thing I've learned working on the industry side. Sure. They are so worried about what the regulations are everywhere. This regulation, this state, this state. I mean, they they want to follow every day. <laughs> they make up rules just to follow them. Like, this, you know, they are not, they, they're focus very much is let's do this as much by the rules as possible right so that so you're that saying the very, leagues aren't rigged because they're in right. with the sports well i mean right it would just fly so far in the face of the culture of the industry like yeah. like to set up the back like like if i wanted the, like if i let's say i wanted the back channel let's say i'm the rogue you know guy and i make lines ink right and i'm not i want to be because i am associated with the company i want to make sure i would yeah. not do this but let's say you know, contrary to fact, I'm some person who works for a, a lines maker, and I'm I'm wearing the black hat today, and I want all the all the inside information. And I said to my customer, Beaverbet, you know, and understand this is a customer relation. This is our customer, right? Yeah. This is not this is right. This is not somebody who is not our buddy buddy. This is not you know. This is a business relationship, right? And I go to my contact there, and I say. Hey, I see you got this guy working for you. Maybe you just set up a batch. They would be like, eh. <laughs> like I would be, like, I would be, you know, I mean, no. Like we need a new it, line provider. That that would just, I mean, I'm just telling you, like that would go so hard against the culture. They'd be like, red, hey, hey, make lines, ink, dude. Your guy just got way out of line. Like, you know, yeah. like no, like so, 
So it's not, there's no, I, I just, it's just not how the industry works. Could it work that way? Of course. I mean, the industry could be crooked. You know, it could, everything people are worried about, it's all, it, people are worried about it because it's theoretically possible. You know, pe- you know, it's theoretically possible that the coach is on the horn with the, 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 the guys that we make lines and, hey, we're playing such and such in the second half today. I mean, obviously that the phones exist, that's theoretically possible, but it's so counter to the culture of the industry. They, again, the culture of the industry is like, I mean, red tape on top of red tape on top of red tape. It just doesn't work that way at all. So, yeah. yeah you know my favorite part of this? In- yeah, go, go I'll, just say, I'll, I'll, just, I'll say just real quick. My favorite part of this interview is going to be, we're going to clip this up, right? And we're going to post it on social media. And there are many people who are like, no, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Like the guy who literally wrote the book and has the insider knowledge because you're going against conspiracy. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. I, I'm already, I'm ready for it. Come on, Twitter, tell me, tell me all your conspiracy like, theories. Like, like well, the ultimate source of knowledge. Yeah. Like, no, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about because we have this argument almost every oh, week yeah. about market makers. Well, and, and it's and easy to say, oh, well, he's he's in on it too. I mean, whatever. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, but the, yeah, but the, yeah, the major point here would be that those lines would be so so sharp that there would be like a form of a new market market maker well, in a weird way, right? This is the thing that there's the, the other thing is like the lines are there's so much beatable stuff on there, right? True. Like 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 we say in the book, and this is very much true, besides trying to follow every rule that he, there's a million rules, right? And as I said, they're worried about following every rule. The other thing they're worried about is that everything works. There's also a million moving parts. I mean, think yeah. about I mean maybe you haven't thought about it, but like there's a ton of product on these websites now. There's a ton of bets you can make. Those bets come from different sources. You know, this company might make the NBA lines. They might be in charge of making the player props in this other country. Company might be in charge of making the the the, the in-game you know prop bets or the micro bets or whatever they call them. And this other company, I mean, it literally could be three different companies. One makes the single game parlay product. One makes the 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 in-game prop product. One makes the player props pregame and the some of the other stuff, right? Could be three completely separate sources of information. And all that stuff has to work together, like software-wise. And it's just, I mean, there's bugs all the time. And like mm-hmm. it's just that's what they're worried about. They're worried that that stuff yeah. doesn't break. You know, they're not worried about trying to screw you over on someone's prop. I mean, it's just it's just so far from the radar of, of how any of this stuff works. Right. So at the same time, I fully understand why the conspiracy theories exist, because if you don't know, if you don't know (laughs) how, you know, what they're actually worried about, then, yeah, you might be, you know, you know, and are these are these like, you know, super virtuous humans that are above? See, of course not. They're just people like the rest of us that are running these. Again, they just have they just have bigger things to worry about. They're just trying to keep the lights on for 95 percent of the their effort. Yeah. One uh, one of the things that I thought was really good in Interception is the, I, I, at least the way I interpreted it was a kind of like self onus or uh, maybe even a self awareness. And you say, I didn't think the, the language you use is like, are your vibes off? And one one question I wanted to ask you is around, you know, you see a lot of people with trends and all these different angles. And I think logic does a pretty good job of talking and, and deconstructing those things. But, you know, what is your opinion on a lot of these angles and trends and, you know, talk a little bit about that onus of right if you are well, there, like what's your what's your job in like measuring your own output and your own right. performance you know so okay so angles are tricky because everything like let's take uh let's take uh wind in an nfl game right okay. someone okay. had to be the first person to figure out that the, the wind affects the total in the nfl game Someone figured that out before everyone else, right? Yeah. Well, if they figure this out and their angle is, hey, when it's windy, I'm going to bet under or whatever. Um, I mean, that would have won. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that was good insight, right? And then what happens? Well, over time, that information leaks. How does it leak? I mean, if you're not careful about how you bet it, it leaks because the people you're betting into try to figure out what you're doing. <laughs> That's the first way information leaks. So the first guy that decides, you know, betting every windy game under is a good idea. Well, if that's all they do, then and they win, 
after after a while, a guy taking the bet says, "Hey, what is this guy doing to win?" Starts looking at it, figures it out, and then he tells his buddies. He says, "Hey, guess what I figured out? Figured out every time you bet under to, to win it. You know, and that's how it works, right? So the information leaks, and then and then it becomes well known, and then it's in the market, right? Once it becomes well known like that, then all the nerds that are in the corner, they all know about that. They don't miss that when they're fighting over what the price should be, right? So so if you come in 15 years after everyone figured this out and said, I figured something out about the win, well, you're too late, <laughs> you know? So so the problem with these trends is like, is like the idea is not wrong. The idea is exactly right. You're trying to figure out something that a little thing that matters that other people haven't figured out yet. The problem is that a lot of the people who tout this stuff don't have the perspective or history to understand what's already figured out and what's not, you know? And how do you do that? Well, I mean, so so that's the answer. I mean, whenever people say, how do you know if you're winning or not? The answer is, well, you have to know what's in the line. You have to understand yeah. what went into making that line, who bet what, where, why. You have to reverse engineer their process. like. Sometimes at the higher level, you have to literally know who the other betters are, you know, in the pool, know what they tend to bet, why, you know, like you just have to, and, and you, there's no way to know that, just snap your fingers and know that. You just have to network and be involved in the, right? So, um, but yeah, that's the answer. The answer is you have to know what's accounted for in a line and what's not, how the line got made. Yeah. And, and this is why I'm like, the model stuff is great because because when you go the the if you look at um trying to think of an example like uh i mean just just uh, it, let's let's say you look at um well i found one it wnba las vegas got a wnba team and uh uh i got season tickets went every game and uh i never bet the league before never looked at it before but every every time out i would look at the live line and then I figured out very quickly that the, the 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 there's like a timeout every in the midway through the fourth quarter every time, and the total was too high every time, every single game. You know why? I don't know, but whoever made the line was just had a model. The model was just wrong. So how did I know that? Mo how did how did I have the confidence to know that I was right and that number was wrong? Well, I. Just know the kind of work that might go into it on the other end. Yeah. I know it doesn't have to be a lot of work. It's WNBA. Maybe someone kind of said, yeah, we need to put WNBA lines up. Okay. They put a model. Some guy wrote it once, never really looked at it again. Doesn't get bet that much. You know, if all of a sudden the entire city of Las Vegas was betting under at that point, well, eventually someone yeah. would look at it. You know, you somewhere count. before then, and it just kind of slips through the cracks. And and that's so. So, how do you know it's good? Well, you have to just kind of know what went into making the line. Yeah. You know, and there's no other way to do that other than to just immerse yourself. You just have to watch games. You have to watch lines. You have to watch. Yeah. You just have to be there. So yeah. maybe betting a uh, prime time unders on sa Sunday night right before kickoff. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe pump the brakes a little bit. I, I, I would say, I would say that, here. I would say that particular angle is probably. But travel, for instance, sure, I, mean, sure, I hear sure, people sure. tout the tra the travel was a real angle. Like yeah. people legitimately made money. The first people that figured out how the travel worked. Yeah, yeah, no, now I, it's I, in I the line. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now it's like, in the line. It's but that, so, that. so you have to know that history, right? It, yeah. You can't know if you're a newcomer to sports betting. You can't know just because you know that travel is accounted for in this stuff mm -hmm. it just you have to know <laughs> like you have to be involved right. and figure out oh people are accounting for this yeah right. this is gonna piss so many people off i can't wait for this to post <laughs> i gotta i have a question on the uh, variance and, and models so p part of what we do is better education you know trying to educate people on a lot of the things that you talk about in logic and interception right Right. And another part of what we do is we're, 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 you know, frankly trying to make as much money as possible in, in gambling. We, we made a model. Seth is the, the builder of the model to um, we have one for NFL and college spreads specifically. And we, we struggle sometimes with the message of like 
how successful a model can or should ultimately be against a major market like this, right? Right. So what is your take or thoughts on number one variance, especially in like a week to week or month to month, because, you know, uh, our model will go four and six one week and then it's the worst fucking thing in the world according to social media, right? But, you know, you zoom out obviously over large sample size, it performs better, et cetera, that type of stuff. But So what's your opinion on one, how good models like that can generally be and two how recreational betters either using models or trying to build models should think about variance in that respect okay so my the way i think about this problem is the model exist so so what you're betting on is not the model you're betting on an angle this is how i look at it so you have a thesis i think these lines are not accounting for x right so this is why I said that the angle and the trend stuff is tricky yeah. because because this is how you win is you come up with some thesis for what is or isn't in the line that you're accounting for back, right? And um, at various times in my career, it's been various different things. I mean, for a while, we thought we had the best relief pitching projection in the world. We were like, we're, we're nailing relief pitching better than anyone else. That was basically our, our thesis, right? Um, and other things, right? So, um, it's, it's, so you have a thesis, you say, I think I'm going to win because X, right? So what's the purpose of the model? The purpose of the model is to quantify everything else is to give you a baseline, right? So the goal of the model is to say, okay, if the thing that I think is important, absent that thing, what are all the other factors I know about that matter? Let me try to make a line in a vacuum, right? And then let me compare it to the market, see what I'm doing. Maybe I learned something about what I'm not accounting for by comparing it to the market. But I try to look for that signal of, is the market accounting for the thing that I'm trying to bet on or not, hmm. right? That's what I'm trying to do with the model. So I don't look at it like, oh, the model goes four, six, six, and four. What I want to know is I'm looking to answer the question, is the thing that I'm trying to bet on a thing that is it real or is it not? Is this actually an opportunity in the market that it, in the betting opportunities that, that are available to me? Is this actually a bettable thing or not? And to me, that's what the model's for. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's my answer. So now, now, as for variance, I mean, it could be brutal. <laughs> it could be absolutely brutal. And there have definitely been times when we were like, man, I swear to God, we have an edge here. <laughs> <laughs> and you know and it just was not not working out that way but the thing is i will say I, a, a fair number of those times we ended up coming to the conclusion that we we were missing something like in the model right mm -hmm. so like so like it was yes the thing we were like we were correct about the thing we wanted to bet on but we had made enough mis other mistake in the model that we were it wasn't clean. The signal yeah. of the things we were trying to bet on was not as clean as we want it as it should be, right? So that's that's what I would that's what I would say. Models for models for uh, trying to quantify everything you're not betting on, and then comparing it to what. Again, you're trying to you're trying to reverse engineer what's in the line. You're trying to figure out okay, if this line is and you and 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 it's a series of lines. You're not looking at one line. You're looking at a whole seasons kind of full of lines and you're saying okay i'm looking and you can do this in game too i mean this is easier to do it's much easier to do against the modeled lines than it is against the market lines the markets are chaotic messes and there's lots of brains involved and they're hard to reverse engineer some models line it's easy to, i mean it's literally under every second every fourth quarter in the middle timeout why i don't know they they screwed up the model Right. Like literally the answer is that simple. Whereas with the market, it's I mean, it's never that simple. It's there's it's a chaotic, you know, mash of opinions. And, <laughs> and, and you'd be like, wait, why? Yeah. Why is the market always here in in these games? And you're just like, I don't know. <laughs> and, and then and then it's your if And if ever you're like, I don't understand why the market behaves this way. It's your job to figure out why. It's not your job to just blindly bet against it, which is what a lot of people do. They say, I don't understand why the market's always high in Seattle. Let me bet under. 
no, <laughs> no, don't do that. You know, so, you're missing something. Yeah, yeah. To, so to stay in the the kind of a uh, nerd in the corner realm here for for a minute. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you kind of just talked a little bit about it, but I'd be curious to kind of go a little bit deeper in how we start to think about some of these markets that you, we've been talking about and some of the fragility, like, how are you thinking about modeling? And obviously, you've come up with a lot of answers to these things. But you know, there's obviously, even in that that uh, answer you just gave and like deconstructing what is done, how modelers and how people that want to try to beat markets with models, how do you think about things like, you know, player models versus team models, different, obviously, right. Uh, methods and things like that like mm -hmm. where do you kind of see that place going and maybe you kind of already answered it but i'd you know love to get your thoughts on that right so the trick with modeling is you want to the the problem with mod so so there's kind of two it's a spectrum right you can you can so player level versus team level let's just use this as an example sure right so let's say you get a sport like Let's say it's like uh, NFL, right? And you could try to model NFL by saying, hey, I'm going to look roughly at team level performance and statistics. I'm going to use that as my inputs. I'm going to try to project team level performance and statistics. And then if, you know, if I want to do player props, maybe I, you know, do that as kind of an offshoot of the team. Okay, I have a team performance. Now let me allocate targets and yards and whatever, right? Um, there's that approach. There's the other approach, which says, no, 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 a team is built of players and players are X good. Let me model a team as the sum of its players, not literal sum, but like as some, yeah. you know, conglomeration of its players. Now, the, the, the kind of dichotomy there is like the, 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 the advantages of the player model are obvious, right? Someone gets injured, you just plug in the other player and now you have a new answer, right? Yeah. Um, that's the, that's the like, thing that draws people to the player level modeling idea so well is oh it deals with injuries effortlessly yeah it does the the problem with the player level model is that the interactions between these players are extremely complicated this is a team game you know at football i picked football for really football especially so i mean football is like crazy a team game and compared to like basketball basketball is a little bit more of an it's a team game too it's a little more individual minded than, than football is. football is like team game up and down in my opinion um and so the problem is if you want to do a player level model for a game like football you have to model those player player interactions right you have to say okay well if this guy's the quarterback and that guy's the receiver they have you know that pairing creates this you know whatever whereas this other pairing creates this and then this matchup on this lineman and i mean yeah God bless you. Good luck. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I mean, there's just there's just so there's just so many ways to get that wrong. Is my point, right? There's just so there's so many ways to 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 do create error in your model, right? You create yeah. room for error, and so the advantages of doing it on that level are obvious, and in my opinion, the disadvantages are equally obvious. And you know, I I think over time you want to. So your goal, to me, the goal of modeling, modeling is a means to an end, right? I'm not trying to create the best number. Like, I'm not trying to show this number to God and say, what do you think? You know, and he's like, you're <laughs> yeah, off let me know. three decimal points. I guess I'm like, it's utilitarian. It's a tool, right? It's a, yeah. As I say, I'm not even using, the, I'm not even trying to find the right answer necessarily with my model. I want something that's usable to find good. If I'm betting, I want a tool that's usable to find good bets. Or if I'm putting up a line, I want to a tool that allows me to put lines up that aren't easily beaten, right? They don't have to be perfect. They yeah. just have to be not obviously wrong. That's the, mm. and there's a distinction there, right? They, I, you know, and, and a, a thing that makes lines obvious, this is a tangent, but a thing that makes lines obviously wrong is if I don't account for a thing at all. Right. Mm. So let's say like, cause this is, I mean, we had a, we had a, um, one of our, uh, the, the guy who invested in our company, uh, impressed me and the way he impressed me is um he the first time i talked to him he was like brand new to sports betting didn't know anything about sports betting and i i was like yeah you don't know anything and then and then like i talked to the guy three months later and he had deconstructed one of our competitors models and oh. his observation was he was like this model's bad and i said why and he said well because in the first quarter it was giving me this answer you know 
And then in, in this in the third quarter, it was giving me the same answer, but this this thing clearly needed to be accounted for that wasn't accounted for. Hmm. And I was like, yes, you're right. They are accounting for that. And, you know, it had to do with strategic changes in football. Like one team was ahead by two scores, you know, and they're going to, you know, they're going to run their off- offense different, right? Versus that was his observation. His observation, it was an offense related prop. And the answer was the same in the first quarter and the third quarter. And his observation is this can't be the same because they're playing offense different in the third quarter. And I'm like, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right, and and this guy is. I mean, he's he's not gonna. He's not a sharp better. He's an investor, right? He just he just looked. He knows football well yeah. at, to the level of an American who watches football. And then he sat there and he looked at the lines and he said, "This can't be right mm. because this is your obviously you're not you're you gave me the same answer in two obviously different situations. So you have to be doing it wrong. Well. What if they gave him an answer that was moved in the direction he thought it should be moved? Now he don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Is that enough? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You know, he knows they did something. And then he's like, well, they're smart. They do bad. <laughs> they probably know better than I do, right? So there's a big difference between not accounting for something obvious at all or trying to account for it imperfectly. It's a huge difference as yeah. far as how easy it is, is it to pick that line off. And so that was that was our goal. Like our goal, you know, my philosophy whenever I'm doing lines making is if I think of something that needs to be accounted for, I try to account for it, even if I even if I'm just going like yeah. that. Even if I'm just like, you know, just nudge it two percent in that direction. Well, that's way better than doing nothing because it's mm. it because now now it's your guess against mine, right? And yeah, so so I forget how I got to this idea, but um no, no, I think that yeah. was a brilliant answer. Like it, it's yeah, just yeah. talking about the different ways you can approach modeling, think about modeling, and then all of the headaches that can come or don't come if you don't think about things, right? I mean, it's it's the nuance <laughs> of how do you even approach the problem. And I, I think you I think you did a wonderful yeah. job. You know, if I if I'm a sports better to you know, today, and again, I'm still I'm still on the industry side. I want to be clear, I still own my company, you know, and, and this is definitely where my brain has been on let's make lines. Um, let's yeah. not try to beat lines. But if I were coming to sports betting and and my goal was like let's try to be what I would do is I would sit there and watch the lines. I would watch the model. I would do exactly what my investor did. I would watch the game. I would look at some, I would pick some market. Okay, are they gonna score a touchdown on this drive? Yes or no? Something like that. Any of these bets, anything, literally anything, but the stuff that's modeled. And then I'd try to reverse engineer it. I'd say, hey, what are they account what are they what are they accounting for? What are they not accounting for? Does that number look reasonable? Does that number not okay it moved you know, okay, it was 57 the last down, and now they got a first down, it's 15 yards, and now it says 72. Is that reasonable? Does that track on the next drive when something similar happens? Does that make sense? I would just try to, like, yeah. I, you don't even, I would just try to get familiar with what, how does this stuff behave? You know, just just, just watch it. Literally, yeah. I'm like, when people say, how do I get this? I'm like, watch the game, watch the lines. That's how you get into it. And you just and you have to be present. You have to put in the time. There's no yeah. way around it. There's no like the, people come to me for the exact other angle. They're like, I've never watched a football game in my life, and but I have a statistics degree, and I had. I'm like, you're <laughs> not winning any money. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I, I will say, like, shamefully, I've definitely have been, you know, the person at the bar at 1:30 in the morning firing on New Zealand basketball live basketball lines because the same thing, you know, like there's something else on, but you watch these lines, you're like, there's no way. But they do not have to be right. Those lines do not have to be good. And if you're actually watching the game, maybe you see something. The star guy, I mean, you're watching. This is in college basketball. This is a great thing. Think about how many college basketball teams there are, right? I mean, I don't even know. 350. This is just the, like, main, right? It's a ton, (laughs) right? Right. Think about how many players are. How many college basketball players can you name by name? Right. Zero. (laughs) Right. Right. 350? (laughs) One on each team? (laughs) Not even, not even. Of course not. Of course not. You can name five, right? I mean, I don't know. I can. I. I'm not sure I can name any. I'm not a college basketball fan. Yeah, I, I yeah. like it casually, but I'm not sure I can name any, right? Um, but even even if you're the, the the, I also was never in charge of the college basketball for our. Co- I mean, I built the model, but I wasn't in charge of the day to day, right? Um, but it's impossible to keep track of all these people. Who matters on what? T- who matters on Old right. Dominican? I mean. 
Come yeah, on. Right. You know, right. so all you have to do is know that. Literally, all you have to do is watch the game. The announcer says, oh, so-and-so is old Dominion star player. He's six foot nine and everyone else is a smurf out there. You know, whatever, right? And and you watch the game. You listen to the commentator. You get to know, okay, this guy's important. Well, guess what? He fouls, you know, he gets in foul trouble and he sits. Mm. Right. Big deal. I mean, hey. that's, a, yeah, and that's not in the line. I guarantee you that's not in anybody's in-game line because nobody's right. paying attention to that. Yeah. Can I can I ask one last uh, question for you? Going back to you being on, it's you being in the industry, right? You are on the industry side, right? Right. Um, you know, we we looked at this at least from our standpoint when sports betting was really legalized. You saw the fight for the market share, right? Between the fan duels, DraftKings, etc. You know, everyone was throwing out free money, you know, deposit matches, bonuses, etc. Right. Uh, and you talk about how part of this fragility is because. There are so many new bets. Everyone's trying to offer more and more bets to attract consumers. Do you think that in the near future, let's say, you know, the next year or two years from now, do you ever foresee that shift, that shift happening where they're going to say, hey, let's focus on maybe hardening some of these lines for a better customer service, less palp, et cetera? Or do you think it's to some extent always going to be, no, we need more, we need more, we need more? to outcompete our competitors, even when market share may sort of stabilize, if you will. Okay. So I, 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 I think it will always be a little bit, right? So okay. um, the top, the top, I mean, I'll just say it, FanDuel, right? Mm-hmm. FanDuel, right. every time, every quarter they cut. So they were the leading sports betting brand in the, in the cu- country for, I don't know, basically since the beginning for the last few years, every quarter they come out with an investor update, right? Where the, you know, all the blah, blah, blah from the suits, right? Every quarter they say, we attribute our success to the investment we've made in our product and pricing and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, they basically said, we think, like, and as someone who's, I mean, it's always been obvious to me from the outside, they're working much harder on their pricing than competitors Mm -hmm. are. Like, it's just, as again, as somebody who makes models all the time, I look at their product i look at some of the other products and it's like obviously they're investing in this, like from my perspective right and then sure enough every quarter the leading sports betting companies we attribute our success to investing in this right and then and then i'm just like on twitter i'm like i'm like why don't you listen these are the leaders why don't you listen to them like you know they're saying it every quarter like out loud (laughs) um you know and and so they're doing it, right? FanDuel, FanDuel 100% is trying to make their lines stronger, sharper, you know. Why are they doing it? It's for the customer experience. They can offer bigger limits. They can offer mm-hmm. more uptime. They can not send you emails saying we canceled your bet. They know all this. The, 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 every, uh, everyone and people at every company know this. There, there, a, a lot of the difference between the companies has to do with things like integration. They're dealing with third-party companies. It's, it's you know, I'm not, this is not to say that people at a company I didn't name are bad or doing it wrong. This is a complicated industry, but I did want to call it FanDuel is investing in this and trying to do this better. Uh, and it's obvious it shows and they've been a market leader. And um, yeah, so I, I, of course, they'll continue to do that. But at the same time, they're going to continue to debut new product. I mean, they're not going to stop and say, okay, we're done. You know, we're done with the new stuff. You know, let's just harden what we have. Or mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, foresee, I don't foresee anyone actively clipping their menu. What I, what I could see happening is a new product coming out. Like, like you know, one of these brands could come out with their, you know, fast, fast Fanduel or something. I mean, I'm just making stuff up, but like, yeah, you yeah. know, like a, a brand like Fast Fanduel, and the and the concept is, you know, it's like fast food, like a McDonald's. It's like the McDonald's menu, but it's designed to just work. Everything's slick. Everything's, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah, there's not 10 million bets. If you want that, go to regular FanDuel, you know, but if you want the, if you want the like, you know, and then the fast FanDuel experience has other things like has cool visualizations or like other, other ways to, you know, um, and then they, and then they work real hard to make sure all that pricing is great. Yeah. And then that product just rocks beginning to end. You know, I, I a hundred percent, I mean, I, this has been my baby this has been my vision for the industry from the moment I started. I was like, that should be a thing, right? There should be this pared down product where all the pricing is as good as we can get it. All the bets go through. Nobody gets an error canceled. 
you know, nobody gets limited. It's all, it's all, we stand behind all of it and it just works and it's slick and it's like on a phone and, you know, and no, you can't bet 17 million different things. You get these options, right. but they're fun. They're the fun options. It's in play, it's in play stuff. There's player prop right. stuff. There's, you know, there's some single game parlay stuff. There's the, mm-hmm. all the fun things, but it's pared down and it just works. So I, I don't know. Fingers crossed. I think we'll see that. Right. Yeah. I, I think that would be cool. Um, and to me, that's, that's kind of what the evolution of the industry should look like. Yeah. One, awesome. one quick follow up on that. And then I think we'll, we'll, we'll leave you with this. Um, okay. So uh, along, you know, what the quote unquote future modern sports book, you know, look into the crystal ball a little bit. So one of the products that, you know, we've used at, at times too, and maybe may or may not be the future has pros and cons, right. But something like a peer to peer, uh, um, sports book or decentralized right. sports book right so what what are i mean we're in this i mean this is just anecdotally like we're in this weird phase or stage with those things now like you got nothing but like weird 20 year old kids promoting these things and like the logan pauls with his better you know exchange and it, they don't have a great reputation i think uh, top down but I can see from a low holes perspective explicitly, like that's one of the draws of some of some of these peer to peer sports books out there specifically. So what, what are your, what's your take or what's your thoughts on how that specific type of product might, might play a role in the future for, for sports. So the big problem with the, the big unsolved problem for exchanges is liquidity. Mm. You need to, if you want to bet on something, you need someone else who wants to bet on the other side for the same amount. And that's, functionally not a thing right it's it's it, if you want to bet on a point spread on the big nfl game sure but anytime you want anything slightly more obscure than that it's impossible to match this stuff how do they solve that problem they basically recruit market making entities they recruit organizations to come to the exchange and act as the 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 counterparty to everybody who wants to bet on the exchange well what is that that's a sports book in my opinion <laughs> right so so that's my take on exchange my take on exchanges is, is that 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 for the most part they essentially in my opinion devolve into sports books um they don't look like they, the, the the window dressing is different but it's functionally the same there's there's someone on the other side booking all the bets for the most yeah. part and yeah. um yeah i i you know i i just because the, the alternative is like you have to recruit some huge critical mass of people who want to make bets against each other. I mean, it's I think it's a huge critical mass for for mm-hmm. you know if you want any kind of uh, success or depth yeah. of offering, right? Yeah. Like De- if you yeah, want, the yeah, depth. the depth would yeah. be a big issue. I think, yeah, okay. yeah. Makes sense. So that so to me, that's the unsolved problem with exchanges. You know, I'm like, you know, you show me one that works without market making. Yeah, we'll see. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, Ed, I think that will do it for us here today. Again, sir, really, really appreciate your time. I know this has been very valuable for us. I know we'll. Uh, I know a lot of our listeners will will feel the same as well. Thank you for frankly doing what you do, man. Um, you know, being on the interest, industry side, you know, putting out information like logic of sports betting and interception. Um, hard to hard to quantify, but I, you know, I would say largely immeasurable value that you guys add to the industry. So, thank you again. Appreciate it was it. great talking to you. Have a good night. And for everyone else, we'll be back next week. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much.